getting free here. <laughs> so, uh, we do have a testimony from Anna. It just does take a couple more minutes, and then we're going to introduce our speaker. Okay. <laughs> I was really, really asking God what part of my testimony to share today. And then I was going to have the guys put all these pictures up and stuff like that. But I was sitting there, and um, God really told me to take it back further than I was planning on doing. So <sighs> um, when I was a kid, my father was extremely abusive. Um, and if anybody ever knew me now, he's not that person. I, I always like to tell people that. My father is a very different man now than he was when we were children. God got a hold of him, and and he knows what love is, and he's he's very <laughs> – I'm sorry, I just saw a cat. <laughs> so <clears throat> because of the abuse, um, he, he really abused my brother more, and my brother had no outlet, so I became the outlet. Um, so my brother molested me for a lot of years, and again, my brother's a very different person now. Um, so I, I had all this going on in my childhood. Um, because of that, I became very obese. I was almost 600 pounds at about three years ago. Um, through the grace of God, and only through the grace of God and people who cared enough about me to want me to live, um, I was able to have surgery. Um, and in about two and a half years now, I've lost about 315 pounds, which is Amazing in itself. <laughs> so, um, but after that, I had received several words about how cancer was going to stop with my generation. My mom had had cancer. Um, I've lost both grandfathers to cancer um, and my dad's mom to cancer. I've lost several uncles to cancer. Um, and there was this, my sister had problems with pregnancies because of problems in her uterus and, and everything else. So, um, one night at Darlene's, uh, I really got a word that, that the generational curse of cancer was ending with my generation. Now, little did I know that that meant that I was going to have to get cancer and that I was going to have to walk through it with victory and joy and come out gold. So a year and a half ago, I ended up with a six-pound mass on my right, my, on my right ovary that had cancer in it that I had to remove. And then this past year, I ended up with cancer in my uterus and cancer on my left ovary. So they did a full hysterectomy. And um, when my surgeon went before the tumor board, and this was so amazing because I should have been in chemo. I should have been dead if I hadn't had the gastric bypass because they had no way to do any scans on me. I was too big. So they never would have known. I never felt anything. When that six-pound mass was in me, I didn't know it at all. You can ask people closer to me. I had no idea. When they did a hernia operation on me, they saw it. And that's the only way we found out that I had cancer was because of that. That was it. That's the only way. So my surgeon went into the tumor board. My oncologist went into the tumor board. And they told her there was this big debate about whether I was going to have to do chemo. Um, but somehow God made it so that it wasn't the uterus cancer that spread to the ovary, they were two separate, which just meant that I had two types of cancer, and I'm still sitting here, <laughs> which is incredible. Um, so now the biggest part about my testimony is that I went through, a st like, I had a his full hysterectomy. I'm 35, well, I'm 36 now. I'm not married, and I've never had kids, and it rocked my world to the core. I could not even begin to describe to anybody how heartbroken I was. And how it felt to know that, that, you know, just to be real, and I'm sorry to the men, but all the men in here have already heard this from me a million times anyway. So, <laughs> um, you know, I didn't feel like a woman anymore. I didn't feel like I could ever be attractive to a man, that I could ever be loved, that I, w I just didn't feel like a woman. And that was painful, you know, because I felt like my purpose as a woman was um, that I just, you know, I... You know, we're women, so we're meant to reproduce. We're meant to procreate. We're meant to do all this. And I couldn't even fulfill my my purpose as a woman anymore. And um, so I, 
I was hurting because I wanted kids, I wanted this, I was getting angry with God. But even when I first found out I had cancer, I had made up my mind, and I told some people, I will never get angry at God over cancer, because that's not, you know, I just don't want to get to this place where somebody told me that the only reason cancer will ever defeat you is if you allow yourself to be defeated in the name of Jesus. That's, that's where cancer wins. So I was determined not to let cancer win. So I'm depressed, I'm sad, I'm heartbroken, and I'm getting angry with God. So then we have this Christmas Eve service, or New Year's Eve maybe, Christmas Eve, and they're up here singing this song about um, surrendering our will, or I want your will, and I can't even tell you what song it was, so now it's destroyed my life. But <clears throat> So I come up front, and I'm on my knees, and I'm trying to sing the song to God about how much I want his will for my life. And I can't even say the words. And so I begin to have this conversation. And I'm like, well, why can't I sing this to you? I can never not sing a song to you. I can never not give you praise. I can never, even when in my hardest times, I could still say the words. And so he says to me, I, he said, are you really sure that you want my will for your life? I said, of course I do, God. Why? I've laid down my entire life. Everything in my life is for you. So, so why are you asking me that? He said, are you sure? Because you're crying every day about the fact that you can't have natural-born children. So are you sure you want your, my will for your life? And it stopped me dead in my tracks. Because I'm like, well, I thought I wanted your will for my life. But there seems to be a conflict here. Because my will says get your children. Your will says I have this whole other plan for you. And we're going to wait and see where it goes. So then I, it took me about a month we had this fast in January, and through this fast, joy exploded out of me, and complete and utter surrender to God for his will in my life, and I have not been able to stop laughing since. <laughs> and <clears throat> through the course of time, God's made promises, and, and I'm waiting, uh, you know, so my story's not done yet, uh, not at all. And I'm waiting for fulfillment of promises. And, you know, but I do want to encourage everyone because I know, I now know what it feels like to have everything that you ever wanted in life taken away. And it might be different for you. Your story might be different. But I do know how to walk out of it smiling. I was tested and tried to the core of my being. And everything I wanted was taken. But I had to say yes. And saying yes means that you actually get to walk out his path and not your own, and that you get to do it with a smile on your face. So that's my story. I'm still alive, and I'm smiling, and I have tons of joy. Oh, yeah. She wants to. So my, my surgeon tells me he's not cutting me open again for a little while because every time he removes skin, I have the worst complications ever. It's like my body said, oh, this is the list of things that can go wrong. Well, we're going to do all of them. So <laughs> my body just does not do well with surgery. So last year, after I had the hysterectomy and the skin removal, I ended up with another mass on my stomach that got infected. They had to admit me into the hospital and then a nursing home. So since the end of October, I've been walking around with this hole in my stomach that goes way inside. It was like five, six centimeters on the inside of me. So when we started the Tuesday night in the river, I think it was the very first Tuesday night, and my, um, my goddaughter, because she's the daughter God gave me, she comes back there, and she says, what do you want prayer for? And I said, man, let's get this hole out of me. Let's just keep this thing away. So that day, my nurse had come. I have a nurse that comes and checks on me. Um, she had just been there that day and had just measured it. It was like you know, four centimeters around, so many centimeters this way, so many centimeters that way. So, oh, yeah, my body was just stagnant. My body wasn't doing anything. I wasn't losing weight. I wasn't, I, I was still, like, had no energy, exhausted all the time, um, and my body, this hole was not doing anything. Since October, my body was just in this state of shock, complete and utter shock. It had been these two months pregnant. So... Karen prays for me, and then the next morning, my nurse shows up. And I woke up that morning, and I looked at it. I was like, why did that nurse just do that? Like, it was so crazy to me. So 
she, my nurse, Nicole, starts looking at it, and she starts measuring. And um, she's like, well, this is like half the size. So overnight, this stinking hole that didn't want to do anything went away. <laughs> so that was amazing. And then all that extra cramping I had that was continuous from the hysterectomy was just gone. It's been gone. All right, that's all. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to move into the next part. Um, so I, I get the honor of introducing Stacy. H- how many have never heard Stacy before? A lot of you. Okay. Well, okay. So I'm excited for you guys to, to rock. Um, from what I've seen, and the first time I've, I've ever uh, sat under your, under, under your mantle uh, was at Life Center. Papa Charles was our, our covering and our father here. And uh, I was just blown away. Um, so I'm very honored to, to have you here. <laughs> and she's, she's a woman that's after the things that God's after. She's a woman that just, from what I've seen and what I know, she just speaks into the generations and things are just freed and things are delivered and things are changed and the atmosphere shifts. She's passionate and she wants to, she wants to, God, from, this is my interpretation to you. <laughs> I don't know what's right or what's wrong, Stace, but she's a passionate woman. And I've, I've seen her just be so in her heart, in the spirit, just want everything that God has for you all so much. And um, I, I've, I've watched her, and I've watched her on YouTube and just uh, just watch. And um, you never know what God's going to do. And she flows in the supernatural. She flows in just whatever daddy has. So I just would like to welcome Stacy Campbell. <laughs> well, it is a, an honor to be here. Um, Julie wants her picture taken. Judy, Julie wants to move from the IBTC the <laughs> to the DD Club. Uh, she told me. So I'm going to Facebook that incognito, and only you that are in this room will know what that means. Uh, <laughs> and also, I don't know if Joseph is still here, but where's Joseph? Uh, uh, that was amazing. Like, I mean, I, I, I come from a family of musicians, and so I just always love the worship. But I mean, the prophetic songs that were flowing from your worship team. I mean, Julie, I know, but that was incredible. Joseph and the other... Ladies, that w- that was beautiful. You're very, very blessed here. You have to know. Then I heard that Joseph is a top chef. Was he, was it him that made those little scones that were in my basket? Those were awesome. I had one for breakfast. I thought, man, I, I'm, I'm going to get him to cook something for me. And the cooking, it's not my forte. We'll just leave it at that. Maybe I'll talk about it a bit, but... I have a little bit of product here that I want to make you uh, aware of. Um, This book my husband wrote uh, several years ago. um, It's about the actual Toronto blessing, welcoming a visitation of the Holy Spirit. We were Baptists. Uh, My husband and I, we have five kids. The oldest is now 29 and the youngest is 21. We had five kids, seven and under. So that was an adventure traveling all over the world. But uh, but we were Baptists. We come from a very, um, very, very, very conservative background, and we had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you know, a river experience, wh- the language that we use now. But back then, we, we had no idea. We had a mini Toronto before Toronto saw hundreds, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousand people saved in a very short period of time. And then, you know, Toronto broke out, and we were part of that whole early days of Toronto. So I wanted to, I understand your You've become river folk. I wanted to give that to you and your husband so that you understand really the history of it because that was written right fresh in the early days of that. And then um, uh, we have also a ministry to the poor. And so my husband has co-authored a book with a radical uh, Salvation Army captain. He might even be higher than that now. He's he's, uh, but very evangelistic. It's not like social gospel only. It's the gospel with action the gospel in action and we have a whole ministry to the poor 
you know, where we feed the poor. And so it feels like we're kind of in the same uh, heart here, all working toward the common cause of, of seeing the gospel. The, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on us to preach the good news to the poor. And so we have a whole ministry called Be a Hero. You can look us up, Be a Hero international.org. We have a, a bases in Australia, the U.S., Canada, uh, and um, this is called the Battle for Mercy and Social Justice off of the Salvation Army paradigm, like how the history of how uh, William and Catherine Booth started radically seeing uh, the gospel go to the poor. It wasn't just about feeding and clothing them. It was about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ for the salvation of souls and then seeing them fed. So I want to give this book to you here. Yeah, and anyway, God bless you. And um, But you can get, get them in the book table here. Also, I'm, uh, um, Heidi has a new book, Heidi Baker. I'm on her, on her international board, and I was just with her this week, and I'm going to be with her again on Sunday. Uh, but this is Birthing the Miraculous, uh, Power of Personal Encounters with God to Change Your Life and Your World. Uh, so who needs a supernatural encounter? Okay, that blonde lady there in the middle at the back, just, you know, to, to just... Uh, Sometimes, you know, sometimes even reading about them gives us understanding of the, who God is in our current day. I mean, a lot of, we read the Bible, but somehow, sometimes when we read the Bible, it feels like so far away. But God's doing the same thing. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And sometimes by reading a current account that's just like he is in the Bible, you, it, you, it gets, it gets our, our faith prepped for, for now. And this book is called Designer Genes. God designs the seeds of your character to create your destiny. So who you are, God made you who you are. You are made in his image. You carry a part of his to, to create. Okay, Anna, I can't stop. I can't stop, Anna. I must give it to you. Uh, but you can get all those books out there on the book table. And then this, I'm going to be playing one of these. We have three of these, volume one, volume two, volume three. They look very small. But actually, on this one, there's five CDs and um, uh, a, a, a prophecy and uh, an ecstatic prophecy teaching, a whole message, video message on that for me and, and fr from me. And, and on this one, there's this is volume three. There's instrumental version. So if you like soaking prayer, uh, uh, you know, if you like to sit in the, the, the there's several instrumental versions. Then there's prayers for the harvest, you know, here am I, send me. There's biblical prayers for the harvest, fire choir of the Celts, prophetic history of IHOP. So if you're a prayer person, I, well, that you have to get. So these are volume one, volume two, volume three. If you, if, so there's like probably a minimum of $100, $120 on each CD. They're only 39 on each USB. You put them in your computer. That way you can download them onto your phones, your iPads, your i okay? And if you buy two, you get the third one free. So, I mean, you'll be really getting a deal there. But I want to play one of them now. First, I want to play. What, is, what, what did I want to play first? Okay. I want to play. Let's, uh, I want to play um, Lou Angle video. Okay. How many of you are thinking of going to Aziza now in, uh, on April 9th? Okay, awesome. Well, if you're not going there on April 9th, if you can't physically go to the stadium, I want you to be praying into it. This is a national event to pray for America because, you know, like Canada, I'm Canadian, but we, we are, you know, our continent is in trouble. Our Christianity is on the decline, not on the increase. And we are losing ground, and it's not, not going to be saved by the next president. He'll be saved by Jesus Christ, you know, the, and that we got to look higher than, that, than all the stuff we hear. We got to look higher to, like, promotion does not come from the east or from the west, but from God himself. God puts us, and we need God himself to take his place again in the church, to take her place again so that we have righteousness and justice, you know, flow like a river. But I want to play this little video of Lou Engel. Uh, I'm the, I've walked with Lou Engel for over 20 years. You know, we have, I'm the international call director. I've put on international calls in France, Brazil, multiple ones in Brazil, France, Geneva, multiple ones in Switzerland, multiple ones in Canada, all over the world that we've done them, Indonesia. And so I'm very, very into praying. But we, we, our, our dream is that a day of prayer becomes a culture of prayer, becomes a, 
becomes a whole movement where the house of prayer for all nations brings in the massive harvest and prepares the earth for the bodily return of Jesus. I mean, I have a big goal for, for this. It's not a small thing to me. So if you want to pull it on that little video of Lou about Azusa. William Seymour turned it. Turn it up a bit. In a hundred years, a revival happened far out in Tlitzit. What took place at Azusa Street. Where the color line was washed away in the blood. Where the Holy Spirit baptized black, white, Hispanic, native, Asian into one body. And dare to believe that stadiums are going to be filled with people getting saved. I mean, only God can do something like this. But that's what we want to pray and dream. May 28th, the night my daughter was born. Angel visitation, Mod Auditorium. These two 11-year-old girls are, are prophesying, seeing angels, and they start saying, Mod's too small, stadiums will be filled. Mod's too small, stadiums will be filled. There's Vince Lombardi. Who's Vince Lombardi? They said, we don't know who he is, but he's got a football helmet on in heaven. Well, Vince Lombardi was the man who was the coach of the Green Bay Packers in the first Super Bowl that was held right here. It was a night of God's glory, and this is what I believe. I believe it's a prophetic statement that God has a Super Bowl for the church. There is coming a day when stadiums are going to be filled with souls being saved, and the glory is going to come back. And I believe it's prophetic that we would be holding the call of Zeus Street one year from right now, a year to pray the glory in, a year to pray that stadiums will be filled, a year to pray for the greatest harvest in American history. My daughter was born right after that visitation. We named her Gloria after the glory. Come on, can we pray and dare to believe for the glory to return back to the church? Amen, amen. So for those of you who can actually show up, uh, show up, for those of you who can't, why don't you hold a prayer meeting here and pray as one, you know, from the East Coast, the West Coast, all across, and just do 12 hours of prayer on that day. Maybe it's even going to be web streamed live and put it on in all of America as one. Because in heaven, there's, you know, there it, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, Gentile. You know, there's every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation, everyone made in the image of God himself all together around the land. He is no respecter of persons. And that's, we got to, we got to be the church again. We got to be the people of God, every one of us expressing who he is. And I, I, I have, have a CD on this Extreme Disciples. I want to just start because you called this Wild Woman's Cult. So I'm going to go there, okay? Uh, 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 <laughs> I always say, Lord, what are you doing here? And I, I can see that you are the wild women. And apparently, Julie prophesied this over you. That's why you called it wild women. So, uh, and I'm here because I'm her friend. And I am going to take a picture. I am going to take that picture. So anyway, so if we put that CD on, it's just Lou praying off of Extreme Disciples, and then we'll, we'll start. That'll be my launch pad. The one called Stir It Up. We'll put on Stir It Up. Stir It Up. Kids of the nations. I believe we're going to see that this is the generation of the righteous. It is the generation that was spoken of that would praise the Lord. And I believe it is our privilege, even as fathers and mothers, to cry out that hearts of the fathers restore to the children and the children of their fathers. So let us begin just to stir up our holy faith. I want you to see thousands, millions of kids having their eyes open to see Jesus. The veil just ripped away from their eyes so that they begin to love God. There's another Jesus movement coming, far greater than the Jesus movement. Let's just begin to pray in the spirit. Let's begin to see the Lord lifted up on high, glorified over America, over Canada. Just pray. Just begin to stir up your spirit. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We join with the throne of heaven. Send forth your word, Lord. 
Just Amen. keep praying in the spirit. Yes, Lord. I want you to see that we are praying in the presence of the hosts of heaven. But all around us are angelic beings waiting for the incense of our prayers to literally take their prayers to the heartbeats of kids who are lost, that are wasted, that are looking for answers. We join with the throne of heaven, seeing thousands of kids impacted. We must believe. We must believe. We must believe. Lord, we see the throne of God and the angels surrounding it, Lord. Send forth your word. Send forth your word, Lord. Just keep praying in the spirit. I just want us all to be corporate in our prayers. We're going to break through. <laughs> We're going to break through. If your flesh doesn't feel like doing it, just do it anyway. Just stir yourself up in the most holy faith. Our own sons and daughters, sons and daughters of the church, prodigals, God. Shabbat God. Send forth these prayers. Lord, let them land in encounters of the Holy Spirit, bringing people to Jesus. Amen. 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 I always like to just get up. I mean, if you ever need help getting into prayer, just put on Lou Engel. And I mean, he'll stir you right up. That guy is amazing. The man is, you know, 61, 62 years old. He just sold his house, you know, that was given to him. He has how many kids? Six kids, seven kids, seven kids. And, uh, and, uh, um, and they were given a house and he said, you know, I feel like the Lord wants me to do the call Azusa. It's a 110,000 person stadium. And the down payment was like a couple million bucks or something. Anyway, so he said, like, well, I don't have that. So what am I, I but somebody gave me this house, so I'm going to sell my house. And he asked his kids, you know, if we, he, you know, he said, I'm, I'm, this would be your inheritance. They said, Dad, the only inheritance we want is revival. And he sold the house. I mean, <laughs> To put it as a down payment, you know what I mean? It's massive. The guy fasts 40 days all the time. I mean, that guy has been on more 40-day fasts on water. He's done 40-day fasts on water only. On water only. I mean, I've done a couple 40-day fasts on water and juice and some 21-day fasts and 10-day fasts and, you know, fasted a day, a day a week for a year and fasted a couple days a week for, you know, a year and some after that. And then one day I just said, that's it. I am done fasting. I fasted. Jesus only did one 40-day fast. I did two 40-day fasts. I mean, Daniel did one 21-day fast. I don't know how many of them. I was like, oh. but Lou, he doesn't care. He just keeps on fasting. Because blessed are the hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he is so hungry for America to be great again. For America to be righteous again. For justice to come to America. That, you know, and I, it's, it's a really, he's a just, it's just an incredible man. And so, as I said, if you can go, go. If you can't go, somebody mobilize a prayer meeting here. And let's all pray together for the same thing. Uh, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you that you are here. We thank you, God, for the prophetic songs this morning. We thank you for your eyes of fire. We thank you, God, for your presence, that your presence is here, Lord. That, and like Moses said, if your presence doesn't go with us, then don't lead us from here, God. We just want to be with you where your presence is. Lord, we want to stay in your presence. Lord, I thank you for the leadership of this house, that if you're moving, they're, they're, they're moving with you. If you're stopping, they're stopping with you. And Lord, we thank you for the liberty of the Spirit. Where the Spirit is, there is freedom. God, we ask, God, that your presence continues this morning and continues this afternoon and continues, you know, to lead us and guide us this evening, tomorrow, this whole weekend, God, that at the end of it, as our sister has said, we would be completely different. We would be changed. We would be uh, going deeper into your river than ever before. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, by the way, I just really loved 
your introduction. Where did she go, that sister? That's awesome. That was very awesome. I'm, I'm very much appreciative of, uh, you know, what you carry in the spirit and all, all of the things that you, you all are doing here. And, you know, I love, I love people who are colorblind. I really love that because, uh, you know, um, and I love the way you honored your, your pastor and how you've been looking for the spirit and you, you just, you're looking for the spirit because, you know, uh, it, racism flows all directions. It goes white to black, it goes black to white, it goes First Nations to, to, to whites, it goes whites to First Nations. And I, I will admit that we, we have, we've been the worst. I mean, white people, we've been the worst by far. And so usually, um, you know, usually we start everything. And uh, it's sad but true. However, you know, I've been in a lot of countries. I travel all over the world, and I, I, I see it flowing. And, but Jesus, he's colorful. Every human is made in the image of God. Yeah. Every single one. And, and, it's, and we have to learn to not judge by what our eyes see, but to judge righteous judgment. And just, you know, the, the ability that you have to walk that way and to see that way is extraordinary. And the Lord's going to really raise you up, I believe, as a leader. I feel like the Lord says that, you know, because, you know, you are like him in that way, that you don't judge by what your eyes see or by what your ears hear, but you judge your righteous judgment. You're not looking for superficial things. You're looking for the spirit of the living God, and you know how to find him. And when you find him, you don't let him go until he blesses you. Yes. And you bring that blessing. You know how to wrestle with God like Jacob wrestled with God. You know how to see prayers answers. You fought through. You fought through for yourself. You fought through for your generations. You fought through. Uh, uh, and Lord, I just want to, like that woman was saying how she fought through cancer. Well, you fought through for righteousness and you fought through for justice. And you're going to be a bearer of justice for this place. And you're going to be a leading voice for advocacy to bring justice and to erase the color line and God we just want to bless this woman and her her the, 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 her spirituality especially the way that she's led by the spirit of God and not the voice of men Lord give her leadership help her to help her to break down barriers and help her to be a peacemaker in Jesus name amen Amen. And I really feel that, you know, that there's an advocacy anointing on you that God's going to use you to be an advocate for many things. I feel like beyond this church, I see you're going like bridging, uh, bridging between other churches even. I also feel like there's going to be a voice in the city that God's going to give you. You're going to become an advocate for those who, uh, for, you're just an advocate. Like, you know what I mean? Jesus Christ is our advocate and you're going to be his advocate for people that don't have a voice in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. Woo together, together with, yeah, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. On earth as it is in heaven. I would like you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Um, this is a verse that we all know. Maybe start with verse 4 just because I like to read the Bible. It's awesome. Uh, but when God, but God who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Amen. The grace, by grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together. Don't you see how many times it says together, 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 you know? And Jesus even says in John 17, the glory that I had together with. I love that word, those words. That's my favorite prepositional phrase in the whole world, together with. I often say that with Wesley, to my husband Wesley, Wesley, don't you just love to be together with? You know, it's, it's, my, it's a great phrase. Anyway, together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us together. Oh my goodness, I love it. So many togethers and heavenly and made us Oh, where am I? Lost it already. Uh, us up together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Then is this verse that we all know, for by grace we have been saved through faith, that not of ourselves, 
It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And what I love about God is that, is that he's, a, he's a dreamer. God is a dreamer. I, I often, you know, we often think about people being dreamers and that, you know, because people receive dreams from God. But I, I feel like God puts dreams into people that he's dreaming himself. You know, that he, he, has, a, he has a dream. God has a dream. And as we can see from this text, None of us are saved by works. We all get to heaven the same way. There's, we none of, and it's not of works. None of us are good enough. All of us need the saving blood of Jesus Christ, the, you know, who, who died on the cross for our sins, and we need to believe in that. And it's by grace, sheer grace. None of us deserve it. It's only his goodness, no matter what our background. There's no sin too great. There's nothing too far from the blood of Christ that we cannot be redeemed. Not, you know, addictions or whatever. I mean, my... My, I grew up in an alcoholic home. My dad lost his business when I was about 12 years old and became an alcoholic. And it was a very tough time for my family because we have seven kids. And we had seven kids. I have five brothers and a twin sister. And, uh, you know, we were very close in age. The seventh child was born when the oldest was six. And my, the kids I had, the oldest was seven when the fifth was born. They were pretty close, but not near as close as my mom had us. We were all together because I have a twin sister. And you know, when my dad became an alcoholic, it was so hard on our whole family. As, as Anna was sharing, you know, sometimes those, the, the impact of what the father does or what the parents do, what the mother does, it, it affects us all. And we all have a story here. You know, sometimes you think at the front, you're standing at the front, you don't have a story. Well, we all got stories. I know them all, okay? I know a lot of speakers. That's what I do for a living. I, I go around and I speak different places. But I'm telling you that, that I know a lot of the speakers in a lot of places, and everybody has a story. We're just the same. God's not a respecter of persons. But the great thing about God is that he saved us all. He has saved us all. He has so much power that it does not matter where we come from, we can all be gloriously washed by the blood of the Lamb and be white. Though our sins were as scarlet, we can be white as snow. And my dad, you know, became a Christian, which is great news. And later, later in life, and and uh, was was awesome. Is still alive, and and it was it's fantastic. But it was it was tough for a season there when I was growing up, and and um. And now we work with a lot of different people in different places, in different nations, and just seeing them come into the place, into the calling of God. But we are all saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. So not one single one of us can boast. There's nobody better, nobody worse. We're, we're, all, we're all the same. That's why it's really important for us to to see each other as God sees us, you know? That's why I love prophecy, because it helps me to see like, that, like our sister sees. It helps me. I often close my eyes when I'm going to prophesy, so I don't, get, I don't get hung up on externals, and I say, Jesus, what do you see? God, what do you show me in the spirit what you see? Let me hear in the spirit what you hear. I don't want to be thrown off by external things. I want to I want to I want to feel what you feel and I want to I want to declare it in the way that you declare it and I feel like our sister here she sees like that too and the Lord's going to really use her to prophesy and be a peacemaker but um you know but God he's a dreamer he's such a dreamer and here it's very clear from this text what a dreamer he is you know, by grace, we've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, lest none of us could, should boast. We all know, you know, not of works, so, lest anyone should boast. But then it says this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not saved by good works, but we're saved for good works. God has a dream, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I'm going to personalize that. Not of works that I should boast, but I am God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. And when I think about that, I think this is just the way God thinks. God says, 
I have a dream. I have a dream. And I'm going to create. And I'm going to put knit her together in her mother's womb with a twin sister. I have a dream. You know, and my dream is exceedingly abundantly above anything she could ever ask or think. And when I knit her together in her mother's womb, and I'm going to have her born on a certain day in Beachy, Saskatchewan, a tiny town so small that most people in Saskatchewan, Canada, don't even know where that town is. But I have a dream. And I have, in when I created her beforehand, I created good works for her to do. I created her to be saved. And God, if God, if God had it his way, he's not willing for any to, bo for any to perish. If God had it his way, none would perish. He's not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And God has a dream for every single person. It's not that everybody reaches it, because not everybody believes like God. All we have to do is have faith in him. And once we have faith in him, suddenly upon conversion, his Holy Spirit comes inside. <sighs> and it starts to ignite things. You know, you can even sleep on a rock and get a dream. Like they did back in the Old Testament, you know. It doesn't matter where you sleep. It doesn't matter what your bed is. You know, it, it doesn't matter because God, well, God is such a dreamer. And I can just imagine I'm going to knit her together in her mother's womb with her twin sister in and, and Beachy, Saskatchewan. And, and she has no, and I'm going to, she's going to have brown eyes and brown hair. She's going to dye it blonde. <laughs> You know, and you know, and 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 and, and she has no idea the extraordinary, exceeding, the abundantly above. I'm going to start giving her dreams as a child. I'm going to start visiting her. I'm going to give her dreams as a 12-year-old, and I'm going to give her a dream to travel all over the world. But she's from a little tiny town. This will be me and me alone that starts to create that expectation for exceedingly abundantly above anything that you can ask or think. Anything, anything. You know, don't shrink God. Don't shrink God because of your circumstances or your history. Don't let your history affect your destiny. Because God has a dream for every woman in this room that is so big you can't even imagine it. It will take all the faith you have to keep up to the dreams of God for your life. I am telling you. My, my only, I, I've often prayed, I read a lot of revival stories, and I remember reading this one revival story where the Spirit of God came on this revivalist, I think it was Evan Roberts, and the power of God came on him so strong and shook him, and, you know, he was just in visitation mode, and, and he said, he, he, he said, he began to say, it was so intense, the outpouring of the Spirit on him, that he began to say, stay your hand, stay your hand, in other words, stop, stop. And I said, oh, God, may it never be that I ever say stop at a moving of your spirit. Lord, expand my heart. Expand, stretch my capacity. That if you're moving, I'm always saying, okay, yes, yes. Even if I'm tired, say, give, you know, I'll just wait on the Lord. Renew my strength. I want to be able to do everything that you've asked me to do. And God, I know you gave me one talent. I will make one more. And if you give me two, I'll make two more. And God, if somebody's not faithful, give me their talents. Because you deserve the glory of good works Jesus receives glory when you do good works Matthew 5 says let them see your good works and then glorify their father who is in heaven and there are good works before ordained for you and you alone and all you have to do is say yes and I have a dream she's gonna have brown eyes and brown hair you know what I mean? And she has no idea of the things that I have pre pre prepared for her. I mean, not only in the life to come, but in this life and in the life to come. And you see, that's how God thinks. And this, you know, when you wash your mind with the washing of the word, there's two ways you can wash your mind. By the television, full of bad news, full of troubles full of political spirit, full of this and full of that. You know what I mean? And you can, you can wash it by everybody's complaining around you. You know, like 
Charlie Brown's teacher. You won't believe it. I just met a guy this week, just this week. His name was David Brown, and his dad was a pastor. And, and, and he said, oh, yeah, because we were from the same movement. He goes, yeah, my dad's name, maybe you knew him. His name was Charlie Brown. I said, your dad's name was Charlie Brown? No, but it really was. I said, that must have been hard for him. Anyway, so... <laughs> But, you know, like Charlie Brown's teacher, there's a lot of negativity. And a lot of times, even when we communicate with one another, and I'm guilty of this, you know, we can go to the bad things instead of the good one. We can go to the bad things, and, and, and we don't encourage one another. And I'm telling you that, that God, that, that testimony today, Anna, was extraordinary because God, it, you know, I mean the fact That you purposed in your heart never to be angry at God. What a beautiful purpose in your heart. And when you were tested that for that brief period of time, you overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. And you're still hanging on to the dreams. You're still hanging on. You can still be a mom. Maybe not a mom. And that you can still adopt. Do you know how many people, kids that need to be adopted? There's still so much you can do. You can still have a bunch of children in the spirit already. You know, I mean, there's so many ways that God can answer prayers that in, in, in ways that we haven't asked or thought, but you're overcoming cancer. Overcoming cancer in your generation. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I'm telling you, I, I take my prophecies and I wage war with them. Probably you've heard about my son that became a quadriplegic in a, in a rugby accident. He was instantly a quadriplegic, handsome, handsome young man, beautiful you know, and became a quadriplegic in a rugby accident. And, and, and you know, when I heard about it, I was away doing a conference, and I, I got and went before the Lord, and I said, Lord, you promised. You promised if I would obey you, you would be with my children. That's what you promised, and I took every prophecy over my kids. And the, the neurosurgeon said, you know, it's very severe spinal cord damage. He'll be, probably be 95% chance he'll be a quadriplegic for the rest of his life. And five weeks later, my son walked out of that hospital and he's completely healed. I mean, you got to take those prophecies. And when you walk through those trials, you take the prophecies. Like, and like, like Timothy, like Paul said to Timothy, wage war with your prophecies. Don't accept your circumstances. Take the prophetic word over your life and wage war with it. And take the word of God and say, it is written when the devil comes to test you. Take the word of God like he came to test Jesus and say, it is written. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus who loved him, me and gave himself for me. And, and when we learn how to take all the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, we are the righteousness of Christ. He has put his righteousness on us. He, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's God. Gone, 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 gone. Don't you love that you that you can go boldly? Doesn't matter what you've done, you can go boldly before the throne of grace in any time of need, and you can say, I stand here with the breastplate of righteousness on. I am justified. By the blood of Jesus. Oh, I, I, I mean, I, I tell you, if I, had to, if I had to base my life on works, I wouldn't make it. I wouldn't make it. I base my life on the shed blood. I overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And I forge a testimony out of the finished work of Jesus, you know, of overcoming and standing in these things. Anyway, I'm, I do have a point. I'm trying to get to the story. Okay. <laughs> But God has good works for every single person in this room. And, and many times as we encounter the warfare on the, on the way to our destiny, Anna, that was an extraordinary testimony. Sometimes we have a prophecy and we say, well, I had this prophecy and the opposite happens. Do you know how many times that goes on in the Bible? Joseph had a prophecy. The sun, the moon, the stars are going to bow down to you. Well, the very next the very next thing that happens in the, in the scripture is the very people that were supposed to bow down to him, throw him in a pit and abandon him and leave him for dead. That was not the prophecy. But you see, you can't stop what God has for your life. The only thing the devil can do, and this is what he tries to do. See, all God's promises are yes and amen. Every single one. 
And by these exceeding great and precious promises, it says in 1 Peter, we become partakers of his divine nature. Now, all God's promises are yes and amen. But you know what happens? The only problem is that, 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 that they're all yes, they're all amen. However, they just stop being believed. And as soon as a promise or a prophecy stops, start, stops being believed, it has no power. How do I know? Hebrews says this. They didn't, you know, in Hebrews it says, the word did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. And who he's talking about there in the context is the, the generation that died in the wilderness. This was the generation that saw the plagues, that saw the Red Sea part, that actually walked, you know, through miraculously fed, you know, 40 years, miraculously their clothes never. That generation, they never got to the fullness of their promises because they stopped believing them, even though they saw all those miracles. I'm telling you, my just one shall walk by, shall live by his faith. And so uh, there's people in the room I know I'm talking to that you have prophecies over your life. You have the word of God. And the, even if you've never had a prophecy, you have this. You know what I mean? It is written. Every verse in here you believe you can have. And I'm telling you, it's yours. And, if, and the enemy will try to get you to stop believing the word of God or to believe it's for your pastor but not for you or for your friend but not for you and, and, you know, and, or you know, something else. But somehow, if you can, because you've had so many troubles and so many trials that obviously God doesn't love you as much as he loves somebody else, that's the way the devil tries to get us to think. And that's not true at all. I'm telling you, you take that word and you say it is written and you stand on the word of God. You take your prophecies. You wage war with them. You get up and you don't take no for an answer. You don't let go until he blesses you. And you just wrestle with God. And I'm telling you, even if you're Hebrews 11, by faith they conquered kingdoms. By faith they shut the mouth of lions. By faith they did this. You know, by faith, by faith, by faith. And then it says, but others. Even if you're a butt other. <laughs> Add the word other. Don't say the, you know, even, even, even if you're in that category. But others died in faith. Hebrews 11, 29, I think it is. It could be 27. But others died. Optimal prepositional phrase. In faith. They didn't die in cynicism. They didn't die in unbelief. They didn't die in disillusionment. They didn't die in self-pity. Oh, poor me. Oh, nothing happens to me. God. They, they died in faith. Not receiving the promise. So that another generation could be made perfect. That's what Annie did. Anna. See? God says it. I found somebody that I can stop a generational curse of cancer with. I found one woman of faith. And I am going to, through her life, cut off an entire generation of curses of that cancer. And this is going to end in this generation. Why? Because she believed. And when she walked through, she walked through in faith. She's still in faith. She's testifying in faith. She's believing in faith. And... You know, when my son broke his neck, one of the first people I called was Mike Bickle. You know why? Because I knew that Mike Bickle had a brother who was injured when he was 17 years old in a football accident and was instantly a quadriplegic. And Mike Bickle has, you know, had promises that his brother would walk, that his brother would be healed. And for 33 years, they prayed the prayer of faith over, you know, over Mike Bickle's brother. I forget his name right now. Pat. They prayed the prayer of faith over Pat. And 33 years later, Pat Bickle died not receiving the promise. But I knew that if I could get Mike Bickle to pray for my son, it wasn't just my prayers. I could get 33 years for the, of the prayer of faith for a quadriplegic and pull it down onto my son's neck. And so when you fight through 
with your promises. You're not just contending for yourself. Your breakthrough will become the breakthrough for another generation. Your breakthrough, and I see, whew, you know, that your breakthrough is going to become the breakthrough for another. And the Lord has also chosen you. You are a warrior woman in the spirit, and you know how to pray, and you know how to break through, and I feel like you're going to break through a generational curse of poverty, that you're going to break through. God is going to bless you. You're going to break through that. You are not walking in what another generation walked in. And there is blessing, even prosperity that's coming to you. And Lord, I thank you for this woman. You're teaching her how to wage war. Wage war with the prophecies that are given her. And I feel like it's coming in really tangible ways. Not just things in the spirit realm, but actually things in the practical realm. God's going to give you ideas. God's going to give you faithfulness. Lord, we pray for promotion to promotion. Wage increase to wage increase. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, see, wild women actually believe the Bible. Wild women actually take it. And they say, this is a weapon. This is a sword. And I'm using it. And I'm going after the enemy. And I'm not stopping. And he's trying to push me back. He's trying to pop, pop, push me down. But I'm, get, I'm getting back up. And I'm gonna, there's nothing. That, there is nothing that can keep a good woman down. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is that the devil really tries to get us to stop believing what he said and we know that if we press through that even if we don't attain it we are making a breakthrough for our children and our children's children we are making a breakthrough for our family we are making a breakthrough for the people of God and our victory and our faith actually doesn't a prayer of faith never dies a prayer of faith never ever dies. It just ascends into heaven like Cornelius's and it comes down in salvation on a house. It comes down in salvation on a house. And the devil will lie to you. He'll say, just quit it. Nothing. Say, Look, it's getting worse. The more you pray, the worse it gets. The more you preach the gospel, the worse it gets. The more you do what's right, the worse it gets. Just just be quiet. Just, just stop. And you just say, no, I have a breastplate of righteousness. I have a helmet of salvation. I have a sword of the spirit. I've got gospel shoes on. This is who I am. This is what I do. And no one is safe. No, no place is safe from me because I am a warrior for the Lord Jesus Christ. I am telling you. <laughs> and see, and, and the enemy tries to put boundaries. Saying, well, you're just from a little town. You know, you've got all these generational problems. You've got addictions. You've got this and you know there, there's there's no way that you'll ever get exceeding abundantly but so just think small just but hardly believe for anything you'll you'll get what you believe for you know and instead of just saying okay god i i don't see it but i'm actually going to i'm going to break through my, my my mother had i'm speaking to somebody here my mother had a spirit of fear my mother tried to put that spirit of fear in me. She tried to make me think small because, you know, if I ever took a risk, you know, what would happen? Somebody here, who am I talking to here? Okay, I, I just really felt it. Had a spirit of fear. to so just make me think small so I wouldn't be disappointed. You know, she was trying to protect me. But she was actually limiting me, and she put all these emotional limitations on me and, and an expectation for little bits or for that something bad would happen. And then when something, when it didn't work out, like, you know, I kind of hoped, then I started to believe that. God wants to break that mindset off today. That is not who you are. That is not, you are called to be a wild woman. Come on. This is the prophecy over your house that there are going to be women from this house, from this city. They're going to get up out of here and they're going to go back to their homes. They're going to go back to their jobs and they're going to say, I believe in a living God and the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of me and where I go, he goes. And if, you know, I am coming to bring his kingdom. I'm praying that his kingdom comes right in this job site. 
right in this workplace hmm, maybe a miracle needs to happen maybe you know somebody's sick maybe a prophetic word has to come through Lord show me today how I can change the atmosphere Lord maybe a blessing needs to go forth because the boss is so grumpy he's cursing everybody every day and I'm going to just go around giving blessings I'm going to bless everybody here I'm going to change the atmosphere I'm going to just bring the kingdom of God right into this dark place and I'm going to be the light of my world. I'm going to be the light of my world. Come on. And I feel like when we begin to believe what Jesus says about us, that there are good works before ordained for you to walk in, that there's something so exceedingly abundant that you can't even, that God's going to give you dreams when you lie down, that you're going to live when you get up. And that you're going to bring transformation that Baltimore is not too difficult for Jesus. Baltimore is not too difficult for Jesus. And you know, we're going to fill stadiums, but what if we just filled our highways and byways? What if we just filled the streets around us with the light, uh, the light that is in us, with the salt that is in us, and just began to, to do massive shifts because we believe you know, it's not our good works, but it's the good works that he's before ordained that we should walk in. And, you know, I always say this. If, if you think, if, you're, if you feel weak and foolish, you're perfect. Because God has chosen. He's picked on purpose. He's chosen the weak things of this world and the foolish. To bring to nothing the things that are. So if you feel like that, say, I am chosen. I am chosen. I'm chosen. Now I'm going to bring down those things that are. I'm going to bring the glory of God. I'm going to shame the things that are. I'm going to call things that are not as though they were. I'm going to shift my atmosphere. And so I know I'm over time. So Holy Spirit, I just want to bless this woman. This is just our launching time tonight. When I start, I'm going to start with a bunch of prophetic ministry. But Lord, I want to bless these women. And Father, I pray that your word, that the, the, the incorruptible seed of the gospel, Lord, that the word of God that goes out and sows, it's sowed in their minds today. Lord, will 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 not land on rocky soil, will not uh, go amongst weeds and be choked out by all the pressures of life, but actually the opposite, like Anna, the pressures of life will make that seed grow greater and greater until the perfect day. And Lord, that a whole company of wild women leaves this conference and changes their their realities, changes the realities of those around them, changes the atmosphere of the cities and communities and families that they're from, and everybody will know that there is a God in heaven because of the dreams of these women. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so we'll see everyone back at 2.30, and Julie will be speaking at 2.30. And also, if I can ask you all, just do your friend a favor and get on the phone and invite them. Please. You'll be changing their life. Okay. Oh, I, thrift store, everybody. Everybody doesn't have anything to do in between this time. Go down to our thrift store. Darlene wants everyone to go down to our thrift store. <laughs> She's, so, so we love you all. We'll see you back. Be blessed.